time he's going to be talking about the technology behind Axel Network, the world's largest decentralized distributed network secured by master nodes. He's also going to be talking about how IPFS factors in as well, and everyone's greatly looking forward to that. Lee, thank you very much. Great job. Thank you to UNLV, and thank you for watching. Be sure to follow Axel on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I will see you next time. Okay, Right, I don't think we did the intro myself as well. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like me again. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me back here. Thank you. All right, so today we have a little bit of some interesting stuff I hope you find interesting. Actually, right, so who in here has seen the crypto rally? Not an outside rally against something, the cryptocurrency rally the last few days. Any of you in here go home and buy a master node project last week when I was here? It'd be big, it'd be up huge right now. Nobody? Come on now. Crypto did have a nice little rally last week. Um, if you haven't seen it, I would definitely start checking out um, some different projects on CoinMarketCap, a great place to check for um, projects. All right, so we start. All right, you guys already know who I am. That's my contact information. 0.13 seconds, or 130 milliseconds. Does anybody know what that is? A lot of you play, probably play video games. Who plays video games in here, right? What's the average time that you see when you look at network latency, ping time? What's the number you see often? 30. 30, okay. Um, when I was playing, it was more like 65, 70. Is 65, 70 still sort of acceptable? Where does that number come from? Have you ever seen below 35? It's usually the admin. Usually the admin, right? It's really hard to get below those numbers. Who knows why? The risk is actually the physical risk from the server. Very, very good. Think about this 0.13 with this number. What's that number? Light. Speed of light, okay? Can anything go faster than the speed of light? No, okay? So we have a problem here. We have a speed limit, literally a speed limit on this planet. And what I just asked you was, what's that uh, lag, the latency that you see on, on networks? And I'm gonna tell you that latency is directly affected by the speed limit. And these are the challenges that we are trying to overcome. This is for a quick example. This would, this would be a one photon leaving the Earth, going to the moon, and coming back. That's the delay. Now that doesn't seem like very much, does it? Think about having a telephone conversation with that delay. How annoying would that be? Okay, also think about who's had a cell phone conversation where you've gotten that, that nasty echo where you actually get that one second delay. Does anybody deal with that or do you hang up the phone and call back? This is the lag just going from Earth to the moon. And people are gonna say, well, it's not that bad, but in reality it is. 0.13 seconds is the time for light, one photon of light to go around this planet. If you take that time and you cut it in half, what are you pretty close to? 65 milliseconds, which is awfully close to the average lag time that you see on most servers, isn't it? So what you're actually seeing is not the effect of slow computers. You're going to see exactly what you said. You're seeing the effect of physical distance and physical space affected by the speed limit of light. Okay, and it's so cool that we've actually gotten to this point in our society that we're dealing with these kind of properties. We're dealing with this real theoretical speed limit of what our world will provide us. And I like to think of this as clock speed. You look at the computer, your clock speed's 100 gigahertz or whatever your clock speed is. Well, the clock speed of our planet is the speed of light. And this puts a theoretical limit on how fast we can transmit data around this planet. And you say, you know what, 65 milliseconds, it's good enough for a video game, right? Is it good enough for a doctor performing heart surgery remotely? Probably not, okay? Is it good enough um, to do remote aerial uh, flying with air airplanes? Maybe, maybe not. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, there are tons of applications, military applications, health applications, that this speed is actually a huge issue. And this is what distributed systems are trying to conquer. What's the average latency in most networks? They already said this. You hopefully you get down to 35. Honestly, I've seen 65 as your best case scenario, maybe 50 if you really get things right. Because not only are we dealing with the physics of light speed, right? 
What's the deal with the computers themselves? Are computers perfect? No, they're slow. Okay, at the best of times, with a very low, a load, low load on your server, yeah, you get a great performance out of it, right? If you're with a server with a high, high load on it, you get server latency, you get bandwidth latency. Who's used their internet at 5 p.m. at home and seen a significant slowdown? Okay, it happens to my house every day at 5.30. What's going on? Everyone's getting home from work, everyone's hitting Netflix or whatever else they're looking at, all at the same time, Internet gets bogged down, and now you're dealing with latency from all different types of, of issues. So 70 milliseconds is the basic um, time I have seen in, in my working. That's great that you're getting down to 35, 50 sometime. But 70, maybe 65 is what I see my nodes working at every day. And I can show you a little cool thing that monitors it. But that's about it. And I'm suggesting to you is that a lot of this is due to exactly what you just said, the physical limitations of connectivity. So right now, the centralized system, when, I don't know if you guys know how web servers work, but every single time you ask, you ask for a web page, well, it comes in, gets some of the content. It goes back and it gets a picture, it gets more content. It's back and forth, back and forth. Um, do something called get requests. And yes, there's cool ways to do it, packaging up and stuff, but in general, you're asking for a ton of requests. So when you're on a centralized network, asking for those requests, one after another after another, those, that latency starts to add up. Put that latency on the moon, well you really, really have a problem. But simply, put that latency on the other side of the planet. It becomes an issue. And up till maybe 10 years ago, was it a huge issue? Give people a little bit more patient. But be honest with you guys in here. How many of you are really impatient consumers? I was working on a server last night, I was setting it up, I was going through the install process. It takes like four or five minutes to update it, it only took like seven or eight minutes. I was literally about to destroy that server and relaunch it. And I go, well, all done. I'm like, hmm, how impatient am I? And then I was like, I'm done, seven minutes? How dare I wait? Okay, and this is, these, are the, these are the problems that we're trying to tackle. And even here in the United States, who gets, who gets frustrated with their LTE service? And we all do. What are they rolling out right now to take care of that? What's it called? All of you should know this. You all should be involved in this. You're the big money maker, 5G. Okay, so 5G, the promise, what's the promise of 5G? Dr. Kim probably knows, right? Super fast speeds on our mobile, right? Yeah. Okay, what's the problem though? Well, I know they can deliver the super fast speeds, but how's that old server, the centralized server, gonna deliver all that content? Okay, are they gonna put and install 50 servers to, um, to have your own server to, to, to uh, deliver your content? I don't think so. So we're moving from these centralized servers to decentralized to distribute it. Because distribute it, hopefully that data will move to a node that's close to you. And we start to lower that latency issue. So until we overcome the cosmic speed limit, okay, Elon Musk, okay, or any of you, any of you can do that, I guarantee you, you can probably be the next billionaire, overcome that speed limit. We need to move data to the user to increase speed. It's the only choice we have. Okay, there's no way I'm gonna move data from the United States to India any faster over, this, over the technology that we have, the only choice I have is to move it. So really, really quick, NASA has the exact same problem. Um, if you look from Mars to Earth, three to, seven, three to 20 minutes, all depending upon how the Earth and Mars are currently situated. If you go to Pluto, four to seven hours. Remember that uh, famous line in Apollo 11? Um, I was just talking about this. Um, Houston, we have a problem. Well, if you're going to the moon, Houston, we have a problem. Remember that animation? half a second, you get a response. Imagine you're six minutes out going to Mars, and you're like, hey, Houston, we have a problem. Can awful things happen in six minutes? Sure. Imagine going to Pluto. Houston, we have a problem, six hours later. And remember, this is one way. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, this is one way. So, at Houston, here's a problem, five minutes. Five minutes back, here's your answer, 10 minutes. Okay? Terrible, terrible things can happen. These are some of the problems that the NASA is having. Do these sound like the exact same problems I've been talking about this week and last week? Intermittent link connectivity. That problem we have in, in a lot of third world nations, India, Southeast Asia. Internet isn't perfect. Let's face it, internet isn't perfect here in the United States. Uh, bandwidth, okay? Limited bandwidth. You can only transmit so much stuff up at a satellite. Absence of a fixed infrastructure. You got satellites shooting all over, you got moon vehicles on different planets all of which are being uh, spoken to at different speeds, different distances, and requesting different information. And this is a diagram of what they're dealing with. 
And remember, a lot of these satellites, we're talking about one, two, five watt transmitters. Like very, very small transmitters. Um, uh, serial, what's a serial connection? I don't know what a serial connection is. One bit at a time, dot, 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 dot. Okay, sometimes they don't get packet, they get packet lost all over the place. So that is the system that they're trying to put together. That's what they're using to fix this. Okay, I'm gonna show you right now. But those are interesting interplanetary file system, that is one of their answers. So I'm gonna show you three technologies um, that aim to solve these problems. I'm not gonna go into them super, super much, but I suggest you guys check them out because I think they're gonna be a huge deal um, in your lifetimes. And the first one is, oh, the first three of them are um, interplanetary file system, uh, distributed database, uh, blockchain, and that's you know, do we have any questions? Let me take a break for a second. So, so, any questions so far? Who liked the uh, NASA example? You guys are such a not chatty class. Just chat more. I'm going to get to that at the end of this thing. I'm going to talk about soft skills, and one of those is communication. You should talk more. Okay, so interplanetary file system. I absolutely love this. Um, I, I, I was in New York City teaching for two years when my father was sick, and I was teaching out of school in um, Hell's Kitchen, a bunch of high school, like really, really, really tough high schoolers. And um, my friend from Microsoft came and met me for lunch one day. He me downstairs and I'm telling him all about blockchain and cryptocurrency and how he's missing out on everything. And he's sitting down and goes, yeah, that's cool. Well, it's even cooler. It's an interplanetary file system. And I was like, sit down. You have no idea what you're talking about because blockchain is where it's at. He goes, interplanetary file system is blockchain and a whole lot more. So I was like, yeah, sure it is. And I went home that night and started looking at it. Probably been a couple hours. And I fell in love. So what is the interplanetary file system? Did any of you ever use Napster or GitHub? Okay, steal stuff, okay? I, was, I loved Napster for a short time until I got the letter in the mail saying, you should cease and desist. Um, it's a lot like that, okay? It allows us to take data, our files, put them up on a system, and the system will automatically distribute them throughout the world. And the question is, how in the world does it know how to distribute this data? So, you have an IPFS node here in Las Vegas. You, you set it up. It's relatively simple to set up. It looks a lot like Docs right now. That's what um, Axel is trying to do. We're, we're creating nice user web interfaces to access the IPFS, manage your data on IPFS. But you, you at home right now, every one of you can go home to your computer, your laptop right now, install an IPFS node on your computer. Once that node is on your computer, you are now part of IPFS. Does that mean your data is now all over the world? Absolutely not. So let's say you have a picture of your dog and you want to share it with the world. You put it on IPFS. The technical term is pin. You're going to hear that word a lot. It's pinning it to IPFS. Basically, you're telling IPFS locally on your machine that you like this file so much, you want it pinned to IPFS, made available to everyone on IPFS. That file is now given a, a content hash. It looks like a really, really long uh, string of characters starting with QN. And that's called the content hash. Um, unlike the web, content hash does not point to a server. So if I give you a PDF file on a centralized server right now, it points to a specific server. If I put a file on IPFS, it's content hash. It just knows that this content exists somewhere. Now the file is sitting on your computer. Let's say Dr. Kim comes along, he asks to access that, computer, that, that uh, file. Because of the content hash, his, his IPFS node says, hey, where is this located? Located on mine. So Dr. Kim's IPFS node comes and grabs it from my IPFS node and brings it to his IPFS node. Now it's starting to be distributed. Well, Dr. Kim uses it and never uses it again. Nobody else ever uses it. The system will automatically take that file after about 72 hours, grab it in a process called garbage collection, and throw it out. That's so, so the system doesn't become overwhelmed with data that no one is using. But still, that file is still available and pinned to my server. Okay, so if Dr. Kim comes by three months from now and asks for it again, so long as it's still pinned to my server, Dr. Kim's uh, node will pull the data and it'll be somewhat distributed. Is that really, the, is that so great? It's okay. Now imagine, okay, the video that we just saw um, Jeff made. What if I wanted to distribute that to all of you right now? I take that video and I post it up on YouTube. Now all of you want to watch that. How many connections, how many people have four or five, 20 of us in here? How many connections do we have to establish to YouTube to download that video? One for every single one of us. 
Okay? If we had every one of us had an IPFS node here, one of us would go grab that video, the video would be pulled down locally, and then we would all be sharing that node. The data would be, would be shared amongst us. So the first person that requested, it's a little slow for them. But the second person and everyone after that, the information is transferred from the local node up to IPFS and distributed. If I had some more time, I would have made some more graphics, but this is all I got. So it's a method to automatically take data and distribute it all over the world. And it's done um, through, through a system where it's done like through an election. If people are using it, tons of people are using it, it stays fresh on the system, it gets decentralized, it gets kept in buffers all around the world, and it's made available. If nobody's using it, the content hash is always available, so if you know where it is, if someone pins it, it'll always be available. But once it gets unpinned, and once no, one gets, no one's using it anymore, the file is wiped. The content hash will always exist. The second thing that's really cool. Imagine a file system where you have a, you have a file manager, and you upload a word. Who, who has ever done this? I know everyone has done this. How many times have you downloaded the same document to your downloads directory, and you see the number one, number two, number three after it? That happens all the time. Imagine that when you downloaded that file, the file system said, hey, seen this already. We're not gonna make another one because we already have this in our file system already. Just say, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna deal with it because you already have an exact copy. Wouldn't that be really, really cool? Okay, that's called deduplication. IPFS does that automatically. Say Dr. Kim and I post the exact same picture of George Washington. Each one, he and I will get back the exact same content address. The system does not allow the exact same data to be on the system. How many YouTube videos are duplicated on YouTube right now? Tons, okay? How much data out there is duplicated right now on the internet? Tons. Does that slow the internet down? Does that cost money? Absolutely. Okay, remember last time, cheaper and faster? IPFS says, if you put the exact same information on me, I'm gonna just return the exact same content hash because it is the exact same content. Okay, so think about how great that is for anybody. Think about your hospital or a doctor or a lawyer, you drop the same file on um, IPFS, it goes, hey dude, you don't need to copy this. It's already available for you. Okay, deduplication. Okay, and lastly, each one of these are, are, are a node. Oh, so, well, not lastly. Um, each one of these are a node. So you can actually do lookups on them. So what you can do is you can say, on, each, on this node, I'm gonna create a library. And this library is gonna contain whatever. And then that node can come to source for the entire world of that information. And again, the same thing will happen. Um, people will come, get that information for the first time, it'll be put out to the entire um, internet, and if people continue to use it, it'll continue to be distributed. Right now, we have some people using it. Archivists, people who want to archive tons of information, it's a great system for them. Again, deduplication, it's easy distribution of data. Um, service providers, um, people who do peer-to-peer -peer -peer content delivery, that's exactly the business that Axel is getting involved in. Researchers, researchers need to share huge, huge, huge data sets. IPFS is a great, great way uh, to do that. The developing world, I think IPFS is gonna make some huge inroads in the developing world because it allows good functionality over really, really poor networking. Um, and once this data that's meaningful, if think, about, think about having IPFS on Mars. You're the first person on Mars is gonna wait a really, really, really long time for that file to get there. But the second person isn't gonna wait. It's gonna be available to the second, second person. And that's why NASA is looking into this, because it makes sense. And it's done in a way that's kind of democratic. We're not gonna move the entire internet to Mars, or maybe we will eventually, but it'll be moved upon uh, request. Uh, blockchain companies, you know, we love this as well, because a lot of IPFS is based on blockchain technology. There's a Merkle, you yeah, know what a Merkle system is? Merkle? Okay, a Merkle system in it, it uses hashtags, um, so it's, it's um, immutable. So it's got a lot of functionality like blockchain, and the blockchain people can use it as data storage and content creators. Video game people know, right? The, the latency is the worst thing that's going on in their games. And I just play games all the time, there's nothing worse than don't take a shot at somebody, and also that person just jumps out of the way because you know, network lag finally, finally, finally caught up. These technologies um, are gonna help make that latency and lag uh, go down a lot, lot more. Okay, the second one is distributed databases. If there's any technology that I love, it's distributed, it's databases. Distributed databases are super, super cool and a whole lot better. So a centralized database, we're all probably familiar with centralized databases. It's a computer somewhere, 
hold a database. MySQL is one of the real popular ones. Um, MySQL database is centralized. So you have a little guy in the middle, that little pink guy in the middle. You have the little access database, which is, which is worse. Um, but everyone goes to that same center node, gets the data, and it retrieves it. So um, the, the, the advantage of that is, I don't know too many advantages. Get, get a complete, there's only one database. You get a complete view of the data management, uh, data model, manage update and backup data, I guess. Okay, but the problem is if that database goes down, it's over. Okay, the, all, the entire operation stops. Okay, distributed databases keep an entire copy of the database on multiple nodes. So any node in the network can continue to operate. When I first saw this in action, it went against everything I believed in. I, we created a five-tier database, a five-node, multi-node database. Um, each one of the databases contained the exact same uh, information, and we got them all synced up, and they were all humming along, and then we started blowing them up. I've never seen anything like it. We went from five all the way down to, we had, we had connections set up to these databases. We went from five all the way down to two, and it just kept humming along. And after we blew them up, we rebuilt them, and when they rebuilt, they turned back on again, they started, they got the data from this, the uh, nodes that were still alive, and they completely rebuilt themselves. It was absolutely, absolutely incredible. And you combine that with IPFS. IPFS is super cool, right? Same thing. If you have, if you have a pinned uh, file on your server, and your server goes down, well, if it was distributed somewhere, it's still available. So you're, you can lose your database server, or one of your nodes in your database, you can lose your IPFS server, and your website still keeps uh, uh, click, uh, clicking away. I had never seen anything like this before. You know, in, in my experience, you blow up a server, you have horrible, horrible problems. This system didn't make this a beat. So what you're able to do is, if you're a, a video game company, you got players all over the world, and a lot right now too, video games, are they really worldwide? Or are you mostly playing with people inside your country or local vicinity? Yeah, because of this problem. You think the band, the, the lag is just too great. Okay, but you can completely distribute the system you actually have a complete copy of the database on every single node. So if you have players in the United States, you have players uh, in India, off the sides of the world, they are effectively working on the same database, yet the databases are connected. However, are these, are these databases still subject to latency? Yes, and there's a myriad of problems with you know, updating a database in India and then waiting for that database in the United States to get updated. What if there's a call for that information in the database in the United States it doesn't even know it exists? Think about that for a second. You have a database in India make a write, and somebody make a call in the United States, the data that is in, on data that's in India, calling data that's in the United States that does not even exist yet. Okay, it's a really, really complex situation, but these database systems um, manage them. This, to me, is one of the most interesting areas. People who are interested in Hyperledger, at the heart of Hyperledger is a distributed database. Okay, it is an incredible, incredible technology, uh, Google has developed a number of them. Their biggest one is RockDB. Uh, I would definitely, definitely be looking into that. This to me is, is an area where there's going to be billions and billions of dollars made. There are tens of thousands of MySQL servers. These big, big, big monolithic servers that people have built over years, put tons and tons of data into them, and people are hitting brick walls with them. Our company had the exact same thing happen to it. Huge server in Atlanta, the entire world is feeding off of it, and simply now it's gigantic and out of control. We need to distribute it. So this is exactly what we're doing. We're building a solution to walk into a company and say, got that huge MySQL database, let's take that, let's hook it up to our system, and let's start, and let's start dump, dumping data. Uh, and it's, um, it's going, going very, very well. A couple of things that are really, really cool about it is the, this is a failover, right? Databases fail all, all, all the time. I've had countless numbers of databases fail on me. Normally what you're gonna do is you're gonna run two servers in the same network center. Those two servers are gonna kind of mirror each other and you hope that if one goes down, the other one picks back up again. And that, a lot of time, is a lot of hoping going on here. Um, because that second system isn't live. You know, it's not directly connected to the internet. It's not actually um, facilitating live transactions. And uh, you're expecting it to, to just start working. Who has Wells Fargo? Any Wells Fargo customers? What happened to Wells Fargo about a month ago? Remember what happened to this system? Wells Fargo decided to call on a cleaning crew because they wanted their data center to be clean. Nothing wrong with that, right? Call the data center in, uh, the uh, cleaners in, they're working with vacuums. What does what vacuums kick up? Dust, right? The little thing blowing out the back, dust comes up. Their fire suppression system kicks on in the data center. They lose the data center. Wells Fargo, big company? They're all right, right? 
definitely bigger than you know your, your subway downstairs. They were down for weeks. Go to their go to the Wells Fargo Twitter and see the, the week of pain that they went through. You would figure a company like the Wells Fargo would have a data center somewhere else. One goes down, they hit a button, the other one comes up. Would everyone just assume that? Right? I would. I'd be like, oh, no big deal, Wells Fargo. I watch it. Push that magic button. Second one comes up. Nothing came up. A week into it, people are losing their minds. I, I had no ATM service. I had if I wanted money, I had to go there with a check. And they were like, you promise you have the money in the account? <laughs> I was like, yeah, how much are you willing to give me? Milk? I promise, you know? And they were willing to give up to $500 at the time. And I was buying something for my car, and I needed $700. But I'm like, dude, I want my money. And I get a manager over, and they gave me the money eventually. But it's a huge, huge problem. And I was thinking to myself, you know, it's a car part. Could I have waited? Sure. Imagine if you were there because you needed that money for something like real. You know, mom was sick, dad was sick, your child's sick. It's, it's unacceptable. And they went down the, down um, a really, really bad road. Would a distributed database made a huge difference in that situation? Yeah, if you lose your distributed ba database nodes in one location, the next one just keeps ticking. Maybe you get some performance lag, you know, another, another one's handling the quest, you get, you get more load on that server. The point is it stays up and functioning. Um, they went completely down for a week, they had to rebuild their servers, all kinds of problems. You think they lost customers? Absolutely lost customers. Um, you know, I stayed with them. But you think if you're like a multi, multi-millionaire, how are you feeling after that happens? I know I'm not a multi, multi-millionaire, and I was feeling like Wells Fargo, you're pretty shady, you know. So I, I want those technologies to work. So we are going to go to Wells Fargo and say, check out our distributed database system. You know, we can take that, put it on blockchain, put it on IPFS, put it on distributed databases, and alleviate some of those some of those hurdles. And going to Wells Fargo is a big, big uh, leap for us, but um, we can certainly probably do something for them. Uh, disadvantages, yeah, time synchronization. That's the biggest number one issue in uh, distributed databases. And I love databases. But it comes right back down to the speed of light problem. There's no way to write a, a data set in the United States and have it instantly update in, around the world. It's just going to take you know, a, a very, very quick second. Um, so data replication, some people say it's a disadvantage. If anybody says that to you, just laugh at them. The fact that you have data replication on every single one of them to me, just like blockchain, every single node has a complete uh, set of the blockchain. It, it, that, that, that to me is redundancy and it's well called for. But when you lose a database, you know, that one thing. Has anyone ever seen this happen? Maybe I'll try to send you guys a video. It's, it's the coolest thing in the world. If you've ever worked with databases before, you would never, ever, ever in a live working system walk up to it and go, destroy that database. Let's see what happens. And this you do it and it just, it just keeps on humming. It's the coolest thing in the world. All right, so the last one, one that we all love is, is blockchain and master node technology. Both things I told you about were really, really cool. The problem with decentralized and distributed networks is there's nobody in control. Um, we talked a little bit about this already. One of the problems we have with central, one of the benefits we have with centralized authorities is if we have a problem, we have somebody to call. Okay, and I know, and I hate calling people for help. I think mean, it's the worst thing in the world to have to do. But when it's necessary, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty great. So now we're going to these decentralized distributed systems where there's literally nobody to call. So we need a way for users to, to track this technology. And what we like to, um, and this is why we embrace master node technology. Um, think about all these actors on this network operating for the benefit of the network. Does anybody in this life do anything for free? Okay, maybe you do some night, maybe you donate some of your time for free. But over the long time, no one's gonna sit there and say, you know what, I'm gonna put a server up that cost me $200 a month, because I'm a good guy. Okay? No one is ever doing that. Maybe they'll do it for a month, but after two or three months of paying that out, it's gonna wear on you. But, so without a central authority, you'd actually have to hope people would, what? Donate money. Like, hey guys, let's take a collection. Best, best a jar around every month to pay all these people for, the, for, their, for their servers. Is that gonna happen in real life? Right? Pass that jar around, everybody putting a dollar in every time? No way, right? Maybe, maybe you do it the first month because you're all excited, the second month comes around, you see your neighbor, he doesn't, he doesn't put a dollar in. The third month comes around, psh, I'm not putting a dollar in, it doesn't work. So what does what the master nodes allow us to do? It allows us to incentivize the network. It allows us to create a frictionless payment system in the network um, to allow people to operate inside this network, be uh, rewarded to work in this on this network, and be encouraged um, to come back and work on this network on a daily basis to make it better. So, what do the master nodes do for us? Not only do they um, form a backbone of our, of our network, but they give us this, this payment method. So, so a master node network, every single day, 
pays its master node note. Every single day, you will see in your wallet, those boom, you get paid. And the payment levels are all different throughout all these master nodes. Last time I was here, I showed you the different ROIs. Some were like 8%, some were 9%, some were 25%, some were 100%. When they're paying 100%, what are they trying to do? Let me ask you guys a question. Let me stop here. What are they trying to do? When you said 100%, what are they trying to do? Try to encourage what? Adoption. Encourage adoption. Encourage, encourage master node users to say, you know what? Sure, I'll open up a master node because of a potential of making 100% profits. You know, that's how many banks offer 100% returns, but none of them do, they offer 2%. So when you see 100%, people are willing to jump into them. Should you be really careful about anybody offering 100% returns? Yeah, of course. So our network will offer returns from 5 to 25% for the first, um, the first year, actually. We're only offering returns from like 5 to 10%, okay? Because it's unrealistic to think that you're gonna be able to have tons of people come on your network and start using your network and be profitable. So a lot of these coins that start out with 100%, 200% ROI, they do really well at the beginning, but then when nobody, start, nobody, nobody uses the network, the price falls because nobody using the network. So what we've decided to do is pay a very, very low a reward structure at the beginning. So people who are coming on board are, are interested in building the network with us. We don't want a short-term investor to come and go, hey, yeah, I want to make that 100% ROI. And as soon as it drops even a little bit, or you don't see one sign of a problem, I'm out. I want someone to come and say, you know what, I love what you're doing. I like your vision. I'm going to buy that. I get it. I'm, I, we very, very carefully plan the reward so it absolutely pays for the server and plus a little bit more. So we want somebody to come and go, you know what? They're paying for my server every month. I'm part of something that looks great and looks awesome, and we're gonna grow this over, to, over time. And we have a, a, a structure that, that says that. I don't want people who are gonna come in and just be, I'm gonna be here for two weeks. We're gonna get as many coins as I can because you have a high ROI right now. I want people who are gonna come on the network and be like, I'm gonna stay with you for the next two to three years. We're gonna build this together. And at, over time, their incentive to stay builds, builds, and builds, and as the network gets used more and more, they earn more and more through, through the rewards that they're receiving. So it's an automatic system, it automatically creates for us a system that pays everyone to be a part of it, incentivizes people to be a part of it, rewards them for their good use of the system, rewards them to be part of, to be part of the system, and to go out there and pump the system. I'm gonna to talk to um, Jeff in the back here for a second on the importance of FOMO um, when we do this stuff. But, um, Imagine having 5,000 network operators. If you put $1,000 into one of these networks, would you, be, would you be somebody out there being an opponent, being somebody like a cheerleader of that network? Right? Put some money into it. You put $10,000 into it, are you really gonna be a cheerleader of that network? So now you have these people out there who own these nodes who go, hey, if this price goes up, you know, if this network does well, the price of the, of the, the coin goes up, I can make some, more, make, make some more money. So now you have 5,000 active people out there going out, um, promoting your network, getting people interested in using your network and getting clients. And also, matching those enable new features. And what we're using it for, I told you a little bit about last time, is tracking distributed data. Distributed data can be put up all over the world. You have an IPFS file, you put it on IPFS, it goes out all over the world. How do you track that? How do you encrypt it? We're using blockchain to do just that. We're using blockchain to track, manage, organize, or as we like to say, soap secure, organize, authenticate, and protect distributed data. Because users are not gonna accept the fact that, yeah, my data is out there. I'm not too sure how to manage it, I'm not too sure how to protect it, but it's distributed. They're never gonna accept that. Okay, you, what users want is to be able to put their data out there and feel some security over it. And we're, we're providing those things. Um, okay, so a couple more life hacks. And um, uh, Dr. Kim has to give some time for a question. And then Jeff's gonna give you a couple minutes about um, about the importance of FOMO in these projects. All right, so number one, uh, problem solving skills. This is the number one thing that all of you should be working on. And I've um, spent a lot of my life trying to figure out the best way to approach problems. Um, Volvo, is, Volvo is our uh, Android, the Android developer, an awesome guy, and he keeps me in check. He makes sure, he makes sure that um, when we're, what we're developing actually has a reason. So I want to bring you through a couple things that uh, Volvo showed me and that I also really, really believe in that I think are really, really important to becoming really successful in, what, in IT or engineering. So this is called lean validation. Okay, it's a very, very simple process that you can go through. Has anybody ever heard of this? Okay, it's a very, very simple process that you can go through to ask yourself, um, does your idea make sense? 
Okay, and you can go through each one of these. This is, this is the real quick one, which is the one that's a little more extensive. We'll get back to that one in a second. Lean validation, validate the problem. This is a problem worth solving, okay? If I tell you, I'm gonna start a business to, to solve this speed of light problem. Are you investing in that? No, okay? Because unless I'm like Einstein, you should not be investing in the speed of light project, okay? So the edge of is the uh, valid, is a problem worth solving. I don't think it's worth putting any money into beating the speed of light right now. We just don't have the tech. Maybe there is some Star Trek tech out there. We, we don't have it. Uh, validating the market, okay? Whatever your idea is, does the market even exist for it? Some users might agree that this is a problem worth solving, but there are enough of them to make up a market for your product. Countless people have made products only to find out that no one wants to buy them. Okay? Unless there's money involved, you, 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 unless there's money involved in the market, they don't want to make the product. Okay? And one of the first things you want to look at um, when, when doing a product is, is, is the market. How much money is spent in that market, and can you get a small share? So if the market is a billion dollars, if you can get a tenth of a percent of a billion, you're doing awesome. Okay? If the market's a hundred thousand dollars, well, you need to get a hundred percent of that market just to make a hundred G's. So ask yourself, um, um, is there a market for it? Validating the product. The problem might exist. But does your product actually solve it? Yeah, there's tons and tons of products out there that don't actually solve the problem. How many of you bought a product, brought it home, and it doesn't work? Okay? Now, more than ever, there are people out there with reviews. Okay, that Yelp thing? Okay, Yelp is awesome. Like, yeah, I'm not going to that pizza parlor. No way. That one I'm definitely going to go to. People are out there talking. When you download an app, the first thing you see there is, Reviews of the app. People are talking out there. And the last one, are people willing to pay for it? Okay, we're in a world of open source everything. So your app, or whatever your idea is, it better be awesome, because it's probably gonna be an open source um, um, option out there. Okay? And then ask up each one of these. You know, does, the, does the problem exist? Does the market exist? Can you actually make the product to, uh, to solve the problem? And are people actually willing to pay for it? But at the end of the day, the slide should be the other way around. It's all about showing me the money, okay? There's, there are lots of people in our world who do a lot of things for, for, um, for the benefit of society and make some really, really cool things. And one of my really good friends, he makes, um, I guess they call them APIs and plugins, for basically for free, and you know, he does Patreon, he gets paid. Absolute genius, and it's his way to go through life. I give him a lot, a lot of credit for that. However, you know, it's, it, it's a tough place to be when you're waiting for other people to give you money. Okay? And all of us in here, you have to keep your eye on this. If your ideas don't have a basis in a real market that makes real money, question why you're doing it. And, and really ask yourself, about any one of your ideas, can it actually make money? I have countless people who come to me all the time with ideas. And ask yourself, can you really generate enough income from it? And even if you had all your wildest fantasies came true, how much potentially could you actually generate and how much would it actually cost you? And really, really ask yourself these questions. At the end of the day, we live in a super uber capitalistic society, and you will only be judged on the revenue that you create. Okay? Everything else is, is fantastic. Patents are fantastic. Um, giving back to society is fantastic. But when in the market, it's, it's a lot all about money. And make sure your product can actually get there. Another thing that Bolo taught me, and this is something I've never even heard of before I started working at Axel, and it's super, super cool, is this idea of user stories. Okay. A key component of Agile software development, does anyone know what Agile software development is? I guess probably not that, all right, cool. So a key element, a component of Agile software development is putting people first, and user stories put actual end users at the center of the conversation. Stories use non-technical language to provide context for the development team and their efforts. After reading a user story, the team knows why they are building what they're building and what value it creates. Okay. It's just an easy mechanism for us as engineers and IT people to communicate with normal people, okay? We're all not normal, right? We got into this field for a reason, right? We're all a bit different. But we actually need to communicate to real world people sometimes, and creating these user stories really, really helps us. I'm, gonna, um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but there's a couple of examples in here. First of all, the stories keep the user, um, the focus on the user. One of the things I'll teach you when you go to teacher school, maybe Dr. Kim will tell you, is to be student-centered. Always think of how can I make the student the center of learning? Okay, same thing with this, with this concept. How do we keep the user at the center of our problem and making sure whatever it is we create actually solves the user problem? Um, stories should enable collaboration. I'm gonna get to this in, in a couple of minutes, the importance of collaboration. Okay, but once we, once we define a goal, we can start working with other teammates to move ourselves in that direction. 
Stories drive creative solutions. We're going to get to creativity again in a few minutes. But again, using just plain language uh, moves us away from using the rigidity of computer language to describe and explain problems and solutions. It's using a regular, lang regular language. And stories create momentum. It's much, much easier to sit around a table and talk about how great something could be in normal English language or whatever language you want to use than it is to talk about you know, if-then statements or if I do this or try and draw it on the board in a diagram or a flow chart. It's much, much easier just to talk about something, communicate, and learn to tell the story. I'm going to build a network that's decentralized and distributed to help people move their data from centralized systems to decentralized and distributed systems because, I, because of all the great advantages of blah, 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 blah. Okay? I can say that. I can communicate to that. And I can say that to any developer. And so they say that to a developer. They go, okay, you need nodes, and you need technology, and you need this, and that, and I need all those things. Let's put it together. But to my customer, he knows I'm building this decentralized network. Most of your customers don't care how you're doing it. They just want to be sure it actually functions and works. So this is a method that you can go through to do that. Here's some simple examples. As Max, I want to invite my friends so we can enjoy this service together. Okay? It's simple. And maybe, have a maybe it's a share feature in an app. As Sasha, I want to organize my work so I can feel more in control. Okay? It's a very simple statement that the user can tell you, you know, within some kind of, uh, of, of work um, situation, and you can cre create a solution. As a manager, I want to be able to understand my colleagues' progress so I can better report our success and failures. Okay, all of us, if I tell you these things, all of us immediately start thinking of solutions. Okay, this person wants an ability to report and track progress. Okay, we can all start thinking of a, a billion solutions. Okay? But this is something a manager can communicate to us. So encourage the people you're working with and your managers to communicate with you in this manner. Because you're going to understand their problem a lot better and be able to provide a much, much better solution to their issues. Okay, dreaded soft skills talk. How many times you got the soft skills talk as an engineer or IT person? A lot? Okay. Go through it really, really quick. And you know what? When I first heard the soft skills talk, I was like, oh, are you kidding me? I'm an awesome computer programmer. I don't need any of this stuff. There was a day that the idea of me coming up and standing in front of you guys would have terrified me. Okay? The first day I ever started teaching was the most terrifying day of my life. I had a, whole, a room full of people down there. They're like, yeah, that room, go teach in it. It was the most terrifying day of my life. Learn to overcome these fears in here, in front of Dr. Kim. If Dr. Kim's laughing at you, it's a lot easier for Dr. Kim to laugh at you than anybody else to uh, sit there and laugh at you when you're on stage in front of a lot of people. Okay, writing, technical, persuasive, and creative. Okay, all three. I'm sure all of you have heard this a million times, and when I say it again, I see this in the back. It's like, oh, I heard this already. I can't take it. Okay, I don't want to deal with it. It's important. Okay, learn to read, learn to write. Okay, it's not that it's not that difficult, but it's super, super important. Um, make it happen, okay? I love to read books. I, I can't look my favorite favorite book in the universe. If you haven't read this yet, it should be all over it right now. Um, read. Okay? Again, fill your mind with cool things um, and learn to read. I, I write technical documents all the time. I write persuasive documents all the time. And I use creativity to make all that happen. And it's super, super important. Especially, um, what do you call, uh, what do you do with a 35-year-old programmer? You bring him out in the back and you shoot him. <laughs> but at 35, you don't program anymore. You're like, I'm done with that, okay? okay you're going to move up to management one day. Okay? When you move up to management, you're going to go from writing technical documents to persuasive documents. Like, manager, I need $500,000 to do this. And I need to do this because I'm going to make you a great person, okay? That's persuasive, you know, creative, okay, creative writing. It's going to happen to you. You know, be prepared, be prepared for it. Presentations, what I'm doing right now. The industry has moved. You guys have probably been doing this already all the time. Um, businesses make people do this all the time. There's a very big reason for this. Presentations force you to think through your, think through your own BS. Okay? How many of you have actually thought in your head, I got this down, I know this. And then you actually start studying it, and you, or, or, or have to explain it to somebody else, and you kind of realize that you don't have it quite as down as you did. You actually did a presentation in front of everybody, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so during that presentation, did you have a moment being like, maybe I should have prepared a little bit more? Yeah, I know you did, I was standing there. <laughs> you know, so you're in a room, what's my most embarrassing moment? I'm standing at a Bitcoin conference for all these Bitcoin people. That goes to me. Bitcoin is an unlimited supply of Bitcoin. 
I'm like, no, there's not. 27 million, all there will ever be. He goes, no, it's eight decimal places after Bitcoin. I was like, yeah, so what? I know all about your eight decimal points, but I know everything. He goes, yeah, but 0 0.000001 Bitcoin can equal anything. And I was like, yeah, so what? I fought this guy on stage about halfway through this fight. I realized he was absolutely right. Think about that for a second. All of you in Coast Highway County in here, right? 27 million Bitcoin, max amount of Bitcoin will ever be. But if point seven zeros one Bitcoin can equal anything, think about that. Point zero 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 one Bitcoin can equal ten million dollars. Theoretically, if you have an unlimited supply of Bitcoin, I'll leave you with that thought. You can come argue with that. Argue that with me. But because the point zero 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 one can equal anything, you can literally Bitcoin can represent any quantity of money. So you have one Bitcoin represent the entire debt of a country if you ever got to that point. And because of that, you basically have an unlimited supply of Bitcoin. So I'm on stage, I'm arguing, no, there's 27 million. And halfway through it, it dawned on me, the guy was completely, I mean, it was 100% right, but his point was extremely, extremely, extremely valid. You don't want to be in that situation. Presentations allow you to speak through these ideas. When I gave the presentation last week, it made me think through everything that I was talking about. I'm giving one tonight for government block builders. They want to come give a presentation on how a blockchain and government should be brought together. How much time do you think I've really spent on that? I'm trying to build a network, I'm trying to build a blockchain, I'm trying to build an IPFS pitting facility, I'm trying to manage a team of 50 developers around the world. Do you really think I'm sitting there going, hmm, local government and blockchain, this is something I'm going to tackle? It's not. You know, so this presentation made me sit down and go, you know, what blockchain does have a lot of really cool functionality. Everything we're building is exactly what they need. The presentation for tonight made me think through what I'm going to say, how I'm going to present it, and how it actually applied. And this is actually good for you. So when you get to the real world, your managers are going to ask you to give presentations all the time. It forces you to think through the things that you're actually building and thinking. Is there free dinner, right? What's that? For the protein. Oh, look, I'm in this free dinner, but you're all welcome to come. It's at the Innovation Center. Innovation, 6 innovation Center, 6 p.m. Yeah. Like I said, get involved in all this stuff. We go through them all the time. It's super important to get involved. Uh, teamwork. Okay? There's back in the day, I, think I, I probably started back in that day, where you could do a whole lot by yourself. You can make a whole program by yourself. You can make a lot of money by yourself. I don't think it's possible anymore. There's, there's a few exceptions out there. But in general, these days, it takes a team to, uh, to pull this stuff off. So learn to be part of a team. Learn to work within teams. Um, learn to deal with, with problems within teams. When teams are doing great, it's really, really easy to be a part of them. So when things are really, really problematic, or when, when teams are fighting, that's when uh, the, the, the real value of, of being a team comes into play. So learn to work with them, uh, learn to be involved with them, and learn to be successful in them. Okay, leadership skills, okay? All of you in here, if you're in this school, okay, you, guys are, you guys are thinking about technologies that are brand new, you're gonna become, you're gonna become leaders. And you need to learn how to follow, and you need to learn how to lead. Okay, and there's this thing that, that you can do a lot of different things, especially if you're age right now. Go volunteer. Um, go do things where you can assume leadership positions at a young age. There's tons of things you can do right now, especially if you're willing to give your time for free. It's kind of against my, 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 my uh, vision, but it's out there. Go out there and learn, get involved, learn how to lead. Um, that kind of stuff is what's going to help you move up, especially when you hit that 35-year-old moment and you just don't want to program anymore. Okay, conflict resolution, so back to teamwork. No one to hold them, no one to fold them. I don't know if there's any real easy way to, to learn that except through, through experience, you know, but um, you're gonna all be in situations that are amazing, and you wanna stay in those situations, you get in other situations sometimes when things aren't so amazing. You always know that you have a lot of value and self-worth in this world, and you don't have to stay in a situation that you don't, you don't like. Adaptability. Um, every company you go to is gonna be different, okay? And you have to, have to learn to adapt. Um, go into a company, you know, those first couple of days, observe, any, observe everything you possibly can, and then start evolving and, and, and thriving within that company. And let me give you a real quick trick too. The first month of your employment at a company is, is critical. It's during that time that they're gonna kind of figure out who you are within them and, and where you're gonna go. It is shocking, people will see a person like in the first month and actually start thinking about how they're gonna progress and grow with the company. So during that first month in the company, make sure you are seen, make sure you are involved, make sure that, make sure that your, your brilliance is known. And people are not gonna be able to go, hey, you know that quiet kid in the back, he's really smart. No one's gonna know that. 
Okay, at the same time, you make sure you listen and know how to follow. But you're gonna have a you're gonna have a, a, a boss. And your boss might be someone like me, when you know, program well, I've done a lot of programming, but you guys have way better programs than I have. And they're gonna come to you and tell you to do something. And you'd be like, ah, oh. okay. You have to learn the proper way to, to, to approach that. You know, how how does that boss want you to approach that? It's a tough situation. And that during those first couple of weeks, it's critical that you learn how to, how to interact with your boss, how to show him that you're awesome without at the same time making him mad at you or making you think you're talking down to him. It's a very, very um, careful balance you have to strike, but it's something you can certainly do. You're back here laughing at me. <laughs> what, you agree with me? Yeah. <laughs> it's true, right? It, it's tough. So a lot of you are going to be in that situation very soon. You go in there and rock it, but don't rock it so much that you rock the boat. <laughs> it's, it's very easy for all of us to rock the boat. Communication, okay, just learn, learn how to communicate and learn how to communicate, communicate effectively. It's, it's, it doesn't come easy to any of us. We all like to hide behind our computers, we like to hide behind our code, um, we like to show people what we do, we we'll, oh, check out, I did this. But at the end of the day, people need for you to communicate, people need for you to just be their friend, you know, and, and, and talk to them. All right, this last thing is really, really important to me. So you know what that means? Okay, carpe diem. Right, C is the dead. Um, none of, none of, if none of you have seen this movie, um, Dead Poet Society, I would highly urge you, Dr. King, you have to see this movie, you're a teacher. Um, before I became a teacher, I was, someone told me to watch this movie, and I was like, yeah, okay, okay, Robin Williams movie. This movie is absolutely incredible. It's about a teacher who goes and teaches in a uh, all boys school in upstate New York, I believe it is, um, in like the 50s or 60s. He encourages his students to do amazing, to, 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 uh, to live their lives, and then you know has all the different issues that come along with this. What I can tell you guys, okay, is learn to live your life. Look, wake up every day and find something amazing to do. F make a goal for yourself and really, really embrace life. I see too many young people you know, stuck in front of TV, stuck in front of cell phones, um, stuck in front of, of, of video games for too long. This is, there's an amazing, amazing world out there. And I just tell all of you, wake up every day to explore that world and find something amazing uh, for you to it really, really is an incredible world. We're all extremely, extremely fortunate. When I turned 45 a short time, time ago, unfortunately, I had this really amazing thought. I spent most of my life being, I want to be Bill Gates. I want to be that person. I want to be that person because they're wealthy, rich, and successful. I said to myself, you know what's really interesting? I never once said to myself, thank goodness I'm not someone below me. I'm not somebody who's, who's in poverty, who's been born into poverty. Every single one of us in this room are living like kings. If you look at kings from 100 years ago, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have bathrooms like we have them. They didn't have penicillin to cure diseases. You know, people were dying at 35 years, 35 years of age. I would have been dead a long time ago, 100, 100, 150 years ago. We all have incredible lives. And it's very easy for the world to show us these bigger, more incredible lives. And lately, I've been really not doing a service to myself. I've been watching the world's largest yachts before I go to bed. And these like billion dollar yachts, and I'm like, one day when Bitcoin hits two billion, I can pick one of those dots up. Okay. Is it okay to watch one? I think it's probably okay to watch one. Is it okay to watch five or six and really start leaving a fantasy in your head that yes, one day my family and I are gonna buy that yacht. We're gonna tra travel the world. I don't know. You know, maybe it's okay to do it for a little while, but be careful what you put in your head, be careful how you manage that, but ultimately wake up every day to an amazing world. We are all in an amazing situation. As bad as any of our life stories are. Just think about it for a second. You can find somebody else on this planet who will just totally destroy that life, that life story. Um, I've been really, really, really poor parts of this world. Has anyone ever been in a really poor part of this planet? Like Brooklyn? <laughs> New York, LA, San Francisco lately? Okay. This is a really, really tough place. Has anyone been to Mexico City? Oh, you walk in. How's Mexico City looking these days? Very contrasting stuff. Very, very. One street is gorgeous. You walk down the right? One street? Yeah. It's like, wow, this is the most amazing city in the world. Next street, children eating garbage off the ground. No joke, right? Yeah. Like literally, like one street after another. It's absolutely incredible. Okay? There's not one of us who can compare our lives to those kids in that street. And there's some way you got out of that, right? Yeah. Thank God, right? I know. Okay? And, and, and a lot of us, especially us American people born in this country, we're extremely, extremely well off. You know? Learn that, that, that that's the case. Learn what your goals are in life. Learn what you want to do in life. Go out there and, and make it happen. We are all extraordinarily, extraordinarily privileged. I want to give Jeff a chance to come up here. Jeff is an anchor from um, Real TV News. Okay, he has decided to change his career. So number one, it's extremely interesting how he changed his career. But two, he's been instrumental in um, starting FOMO. 
And we'll give him a, a, a moment to talk about what he does and the importance of FOMO in the crypto world. Does anybody know what FOMO is? Yeah. What, what's it stand for? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. <laughs> I own, how much Bitcoin do I own, Lee? I own 100,000 different Bitcoin. It's what I wish I could say. <laughs> <laughs> if there was an effective FOMO campaign that reached me back in the day for Bitcoin, I'd be able to stand here and tell you that. But because there was no business entity behind it and no one created FOMO, people like myself who had no clue about cryptocurrency or masternodes or any of this were left in the dark and were sitting there just watching this boat sail by, and it's up and it's down, but I would love to have some. <laughs> the people who got into it are the ones who uh, didn't necessarily need to be brought in using FOMO, people like Lee, who saw the, the value in it. And so now you have these Bitcoin investors who uh, have done quite well for themselves, and they're waiting for it to, to go back up. So, yeah, he's right. I spent 20 years in television broadcasting. Uh, I worked for ABC, NBC, and CW affiliates across the country. Uh, starting in Midland, Texas, and then Albuquerque, and then Sacramento, and then hosted a show in Las Vegas for three years. Uh, wake up at the CW, and I can talk your most embarrassing moment. By the way, wake up. Um, <laughs> my most embarrassing moment was on live television, and uh, we would always interview guests. We'd bring people into the studio, and I wouldn't always have the chance to talk to them before because we had a two-hour show, and they would be brought in the door during a commercial break, and then all of a sudden I was back on, and then they were brought over to our sitting area, and I would uh, venture over there while a story was playing, and you wouldn't see this, but I would get off the anchor desk and I'd go over there and talk to them. And so I sat there next, and I had my guest sheet with me that our second producer gave me, and it said, you're gonna be interviewing this firefighter who is uh, leading a campaign to help raise money for Clark County and he's doing it through uh, this, this creative, I think it was some sort of bike uh, bike event. And so I sat down and suddenly we're back on. Hey, Jeff Marr, and I'm sitting here with uh, so-and-so with the Clark County Fire Department. I hear you guys are doing a great thing for fundraising um, with, with this bike campaign for, for Clark County to raise money for the firefighters so you guys can buy some equipment. Uh, tell me about that. And the guy says, I'm not him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that, I'm not with the fire department. <laughs> and I'm not that person. And so I had to say on live TV, in front of however many people were watching in Nevada, um, so who are you and what are you doing? <laughs> but the good thing is by that time I've done TV for so long, you kind of see it all. Um, and for that reason, I, my ability is, is nowhere close to what his ability is. I mean, everybody's brains work different. Mine's on the creative side. So I wouldn't be able to, to tell you uh, intelligently about what master nodes, IPFS, uh, the technology behind blockchain and Axel Network. I would just basically just be re rehearsing a script that I'd be able to memorize, which I can. Um, my value, I think, is, is seeing an opportunity to uh, help relay information about a technically complex company to the masses. Because you can have the greatest technology in the world, but if people don't understand what you're about, uh, there's no real value to it. And there's a lot of complex technology that we're talking about here. All of you guys get it because you're part of it. But when I'm talking to my parents, my grandparents, trying to encourage them to be master node holders, you know, they don't even know what a node is. I think the first response I got was, so, so why are they getting into lawn ornaments? <laughs> I said, no, not gnomes. <laughs> Not, no, no, <laughs> and then I had to explain it from there. So that just gives you an example of how clueless the, the public is about this technology. I mean, you guys are at the absolute forefront. It, it's like the new age of the internet. And creating FOMO is so important. You know, I, I gave you the example of Bitcoin. Um, flip to the other side of that, which is the fraudulent side, and there's one coin, which came out of, is it Ukraine? multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme. And uh, this was a group of, of people, uh, one of the co-founders was, was just charged with a series of, of uh, felony charges, you know about one coin. They're still looking for his sister, who was the other co-founder, she's on the run. But they convinced, through an effective marketing campaign, multi-layered marketing campaign, to, uh, that they were a legit company, had a legit blockchain, when in fact they never did. 
They didn't even have a product behind it, but because they were on stage and because they had spotlight presentations and, and this really um, colorful array of, of convincing material and propaganda, people bought into it and they were left empty handed when the founders you know, were made off with 700, 800 million dollars or more. And so that creates you know, obviously a, a bad reputation on the industry that we're in. So I'm in a position where I have to create the fear of missing out for a company that is legitimate, that has legitimate technology and real people and a real development team across the world and convince people that it's real. Um, people will only believe you for so long until they actually see proof of it. And so that's why it's important for me to get out there as much as I can on camera and just continue what I'm doing, uh, what I'm comfortable with. And at the same time, it's finding uh, a way to make people interested in our product without having to bore them um, or, or overcomplicate you know, the, the subject matter itself. And I'll give you an example. Can you bring up Axel.news? Oh, I'm not, I'm not in. Oh, okay. oh. oh. Yeah. 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 Take them to the, uh, go to the, the top row and go to the right a ways. Oh, I'll do that. I'll because do that. I want to bring up the, um, we oh. had that snowstorm in Las Vegas recently where we actually had the first measurable snow in decades. And it was a pretty big deal. And this was a, a video that was not planned. And I think this is also Wait, part of it. So go to the top row and then top row and then go to the right. Keep going, keep going. Never left out, so, and then I'll tell you to play it in a second. So I was just driving home uh, on the 215, and oh, this, this snow was falling everywhere. And I said, you know what? I see a video opportunity here. And so I'm talking, I'm, I'm just, this is just basic text, plays well on Facebook and other social media sites where it's just music and text and it's just me walking up a hill turning the music kicks in right at that right point boom very simple video less than a minute long and so when you're creating the fear of missing out when you're trying to give confidence to people in a company uh, it's that kind of stuff that's that's super important. I mean, I can do all these anchoring clips and interview CEOs for as long as, as I want to, and it's just uh, very easy for me to do. It, I'm very comfortable doing that. But something as simple as that, you know, it's uh, it actually can can have a pretty long-lasting effect. That got a lot of views. People from all over the world watch that, and uh, we have our Discord channel, which uh, I'm not sure if you talked about Discord yet. Yeah, but check um, Discord. Did we, did they, I'm sorry, my mouth is super. Um, who has used Discord? Show up time to mouth. It's a video game. Yeah, it didn't. It wasn't around when I was around. <laughs> but, it, but it's a great way of communicating with executives from a company and getting your questions answered in, in real time. And I doubt that a company like OneCoin has something like that. So um, that kind of summarizes fear of missing out and, and, and a little bit about my role here at Axel. And we, we appreciate you know all of you allowing us to come in and talk to you. I know Lee appreciates it a lot. Obviously, it creates great material for me for Axel.News. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, any questions for us? Can, yeah. can you go to the Excel.network? Yes, and absolutely. Show the page, the method of the page. Yeah, up there, one coin. So I did talk about the, uh, the scan. Yeah, so there's the link for method node. Mm -hmm. I try to understand the Excel method node, but this page doesn't have much information. So here there are four bullet points up, a little up there. Uh, one of them is writing new block to the chain, right? Yeah. So it seems like this method node is actually doing the job of miners. Is yes. Kind of combine the concept of real method node and miner. In other method nodes, actually they are separated. There's miners. On top of the miners, there are the method nodes. So method node's job is different from mining. So, so we don't, we're a pure proof of stake. So you have, um, so dash is a proof of work, proof of stake. So a proof of uh, dash, you have miners and stakers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our system is pure proof of stake. We don't have miners at all. 
in POS system, there could be, it's kind of independent. You can still have maximum tone. So the POS here, W jobs, there, there are no jobs creating features. block. But before creating a block, you need validation. So method node job is adding extra function, uh, validation, and then after then, those transitions go into POS node or POW node. POS, so they stay, we don't, they so it's kind of separate concept. So on, on the master node, node does the uh, transaction processing, mm -hmm. it does the uh, node validation, and it, and it writes to the blockchain, mm -hmm. and creates, creates the rewards. There's, there's no uh, proof of work at all, there's no mining at all. Then the problem is there are multiple master nodes, yes. and they are competing. Each one is creating different kind of blocks. So there will be different versions of blocks, right? So all the master nodes have a full copy of a single blockchain, so uh -huh. they're all working on the same blockchain. Um, and then they all are through a completely randomized process, so it can't be hacked or anything like that. Are so certain ones are selected completely nice. randomly to then, then those ones are the ones that do the nice. um, consensus. Uh -huh. They add to the blockchain and they earn the reward. So it's possible if you own a master node, you may, you can, Conceivably, not get a reward for two, three, four days. It's also conceivable that you get five rewards in one day, depending upon your luck. But over time, mm -hmm. the uh, ROI maintained constant because of the because of the random. So it's based on POS. Then which one is creating the block? One, level one, two, three. Which is here? Oh, all three of them are creating the blocks on the transaction. All three, all three of them. However, the higher tier, uh -huh. you're, you're uh, more likely to get selected. So the higher tier you get, you have a little bit more chance on the randomness. Mm -hmm. But again, over time, everyone will um, realize the same uh, returns. Over time, this is the return. Now, we have purposely set our tier one, because right now, Axel owns all the tier one nodes. All the user-sensitive user data, databases, all that good stuff is on tier one. And since we, are, we own that, we don't want people to think that we're competing with them in any way. We, we, we set our, our um, return extremely, extremely low. For a first year, we're not even covering the cost of our nodes. We're actually uh, paying for that out of pocket. We want to show good faith to um, the community. On our next year at 5%, we're basically just paying for all of our expenses. So when we go to the community, I think it's a, you know, right now, the community's going to say, hey, you know what, guys? You own all those tier one nodes. Is that very decentralized? No, we own all the tier one nodes. It's very centralized. So we're asking an all cryptocurrencies start centralized. Think about this. So whoever controls the wallet is centralized. If you control the wallet, you control the coin specs, you are by definition centralized. It's not until you get to like a Stellar, when you have multiple people making wallets, okay, then you start achieving some sort of reality of decentralization. We're in the same situation. We're the ones starting the network. We don't have 100 people to come on board and spin up service for us. We're doing it. So we are the tier one. So what we said, the rewards structure is set, so the rewards are given out in this particular way. The vast majority of rewards are gonna go to our tier two people. We're bringing on data centers. It's a whole new paradigm for master nodes. We're going to data centers. Micro, there are tons of micro data centers around. Guys, with gals, who have these little, um, little offices, they put in a bunch of computer equipment. They're very little micro data centers. You know, they're running like the doctor's office down the street, and they have a couple e-commerce sites on them. They are desperate to compete with Amazon and Google. They're desperate to increase their services. And we're telling them, hey, you know what? Come onto our network and you start building out our edge. So our tier two is totally in line with data centers coming on board. And not only are we, not only are we paying them back for their servers, we're giving them a little bit extra more to incentivize them to be part of the network and incentivize them to go out there and sell our services as part of their services. Tier three is everyone in this room, everyone who wants to become involved in, a, in an amazing network, an amazing movement, and they'll also have some ability to, to do some IPFS stuff eventually, but <clears throat> it's much smaller, and you can see, we're still being, we're being very, very generous, and again, it, it, it more than pays for their expense every month. But all the nodes um, will participate in consensus, so someone sent a transaction from point A to point B, um, so a select number of those nodes are randomly selected based on these percentages, and percentages are a little bit different in the code than, than, than that. Um, but based on those percentages, the rewards are then uh, given out. And over time, over a month period, you will see this reward being pretty pretty steady. So what is the latency and transition, transition for a second? What's that? The latency, so when you do something, what's the? The latency, latency so I can show you really quick. The latency is, um, it's almost instant. I mean, as far as I can tell, it looks very instant to me. So something like dash, dash instant then? 
Oh yeah, so we, so we have, we have that too. We have, we have the exact same, you know, so all of our technologies are built on top of each other. At the core, our wallet is Bitcoin. We literally have the original Bitcoin core. Uh, core so this core. is based on Bitcoin? Bitcoin core, yep. Um, then on top of that, we have Dash. We, we included some of Dash um, POS services on top of Dash. Bitcoin didn't have POS, that Dash brought on POS. So we put on Dash, and we wanted a, a, a anonymity. So we brought in Pivx. So Pivx got the an anonymous um, uh, abilities. And then we wanted to have, have the ability to have multi-tiers, which is an EDCD, which is another, another protocol. We brought that one in. So we're built, we're on top of four open source platforms, and then the fifth one is us. And I'll tell you right now, there's a huge amount of money in somebody going in and coding all this software, because this software is, is coded awfully. There's not a single global variable in it. If you want to, if there's, if there's a, a thing that you have to change, you literally have to hack the code and find where to change it. It's terribly, terribly written, but it was written quick because people wanted to get it, get it to market really, really fast. As far as, um, um, as far as latency goes, we're at the same problem, and we actually hit this all the time. <clears throat> this is our, our, our um, website that every hour it tweets out what our nodes are, what they're doing. And you can see, I've actually seen it as low as 65, but currently, right now, these three nodes are communicating at 79 milliseconds. So we asked them what the speed is. It's 79 milliseconds plus. That's like a transmission delay. Yes. But there's, there's block generation delay. What is your block generation? So I would say it has to be it has to be close to it has to be close to the, 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 the delay between because are the transactions are almost instant they're almost instant on the master nodes. Yeah, that's going to be probably seventy nine milliseconds around the globe. Around the globe. But in case of Ethereum, it's twelve seconds to generate a block. What's your block? Oh, whoa, 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 okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, we do one block per minute. Yeah. We do one, one block per minute. Yes. So there are three megabyte the three megabyte blocks. We want to do the data inside and get the data inside of them. I'm do sorry. You, I misunderstood. Yeah. Do you support the smart contract too? So we have, oh, we do, we will have smart contracts enabled January of uh, 2020. We'll okay. have it for the first year. Yeah. Um, but yes, and we also have our smart contracts are going to be amendable and editable. So we have really, really cool functionality where um, they'll do versioning. So one of the big problems with Ethereum right now is you make a smart contract, you kind of have to live with that. Yeah. Ours is going to allow versioning. So you put your first one up there, you don't like it. If people are going to be noti you know, notified there was a first one, you know, and things have changed. But you will be able to make modifications, to make modifications to it, so long as it doesn't go against the original uh, intent of. Uh, you can do that with Ethereum by killing and creating new. Right. Yes, yeah, so you, you can you kill them. This will, this will actually be a, a, an extension. So you can extend the code. You actually be able to extend it. Yeah. It doesn't have to completely kill it, yeah. which then has a um, the disassociative record that, that at that point. Do you have any charting implemented here? Like that, you, not you know, that's going to be a huge problem. Yes. Like every every blockchain. Every, so you have to right. That's one of the things that all of you should be looking at is what problems can you solve for all blockchain problem projects. And one of the ones that we're going to go to market with is um, a web-based uh, um, wallet, completely web-based wallet that that we that you can protect your your keys. So that is something that every blockchain project needs, and we've identified that saying that that is a, a potential there to have great market adoption. So that's the area we're going to go to. So I agree with you. Look for areas where people need um, need stuff. Another big area right now is the visualization. Blockchain is very much a back-end product. You know, you, you put all the data on, on blockchain or do whatever you want, smart contracts, whatever. How do people visualize that data? How do people accessing and, and, and working with that data? Those are going to be some amazing, amazing things, especially when you're dealing with private keys. I mean, how does somebody do an Instagram um, type thing with private keys? So how, how does that mechanism work? Those are some really, really amazing protocols that, that people really need to be looking at. So you think there's some people who can do Pivx programming, Bitcoin programming, Ethereum programming? It's all C++. Plus. It's all C++. So um, if you really want to get involved in that, it's all C++. And um, it's, 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 it's hard. Like, it's not hard. It's not impossible. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of code lot, written by a lot of different people in there. It's amazing. Honestly, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's as secure as it is. And I look at code, I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> what language are you going to support for the smart contract? Um, so we're looking at Go. I, I, I really, really like Go. I also love PHP, but none of my developers like PHP. I know you make fun of it, I make fun of it. Um, but but my, my goal would be to allow, um, to do some kind of virtual machine where you can almost program in any language you want and then compile it to some type of virtual machine. And that's something that we're still working on. Um, virtual machines are, is, is a tough thing. Um, Tron has an amazing virtual machine uh, where it does its processing on it, and that's something that we'll roll out with our smart contract. Initially, right now, it's building out for us. It's building out this network and getting all the nodes up, up, up and running. 
so we can secure these transactions. And once that goes, then you know, smart contracts are a big thing, but if you look at their use, it's very, very, very low. Um, how many smart contracts are actually in Ethereum? I think like last month it was 100 people developing smart contracts on Ethereum. You know, it's, it's, um, I'm not sure, I could, I could be wrong on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a low, it's a low, low, low number. I know Tron Network has a lot more uh, people um, doing smart contracts. But it's, it's, it definitely needs to, it definitely needs to grow. Well, I'll go. I, I, I read somewhere, but I know Tron, the Tron smart contracts on, on Tron platform are being a, a, a lot, lot larger than Ethereum. Um, but I'll, I'll look it up. I'll send it over to you. I'll definitely look into that. But I would say look at the different options. Look at what blockchain um, companies are trying to do and find the little niches where, where people need things. I think the big thing right now is, is visualizing blockchain data. Absolutely, absolutely huge. Uh, we're going to be back the first week of May yeah. for uh, two we'll events. One is the uh, Axel Blockchain Career Day, uh, which I believe is May 1st, Dr. Kim? It's May 1st or 2nd. I think, yeah, I think it's May 1st. You're going to see a flyer going around um, promoting that, and it's leading into uh, UNLV Blockchain Day, which is Saturday, May 4th. So that is when we will be back, less than a month. Thank you so much for Thanks. having us here. Any more questions? All right, you guys are awesome. Go out there, make tons of money, make amazing, amazing things. Thanks so much. If you need anything, please take me out. Uh, okay. See you guys. Seize the day. Go do something amazing.